was relying on my booming voice, okay. Um, we have a number of tasks to undertake today. The first one is that those of you sitting all the way in the back, could you please come up? Thank you. Um, so um, also, uh, you guys are working on the final project now. Um, it's due December 1st. Any questions on that uh, final project? Okay, just to be clear, you're doing a, a case study of any designed experience or thing, come on in, and um, um, assessing it through the lens of the five modes of design thinking that we've been talking about all semester. Empathy, defining the problem, ideation, prototyping, and testing. So you want to assess the designed thing through that lens in a PowerPoint presentation of no more than 10 slides, okay? So I hope that's gonna go well. Um, any other questions about the logistics of our course right now? I, I've, I've just clicked our little button, so it might take a minute for it to generate a number. Okay, we have a number, um, which I'll tell you as soon as this gentleman walks out of the room. Um, <laughs> it's uh, 1418, 1418. And I don't know, does this number come directly to you guys or do I have to tell it to you? It, it comes to you? No, I have to tell it. Okay, 1418. Okay, so you got a few minutes to do that. If there aren't any questions on logistics, we'll get started. Um, we're very fortunate to have as our guest today one of Boston's most innovative people, Rob McLeod. And full disclosure, Rob and I uh, accidentally shared offices together in Cambridge probably 20 plus years ago. Um, and it's interesting that we've come to know each other again uh, all these years later. Um, Rob is the creative force behind Neoscape, um, a visualization and communication company uh, based here in Boston, which offers integrated visualization solutions. And his aesthetic influence and innovative style are seen in all aspects of the studio's work. He's guided the expansion of Neoscape into a multimedia powerhouse, combining all the tools of good storytelling, world-class visualization, interactive technologies, and beautiful design. This creative expertise is balanced by a keen understanding of marketing strategy in an ever-shifting business environment. Together with his two partners, Rob started Neoscape in 1995 with a simple goal, to help clients and their audiences visualize a world that had yet to be created. 21 years later, this daily interaction with the future continues. Rob is a frequently requested speaker at industry events and associations. Most recently, he presented on what clients want at the American Society of Architectural Illustrators Architecture in Perspective Conference. He has also presented on the art of storytelling at Autodesk University's Retail Summit and was a featured speaker about visualization technology at the AIA's CIO large firm roundtable in Chicago. Additionally, he was contributing author of a special architecture plus urbanism issue entitled Looking Back from the Future of Design. He received a Bachelor of Science in Architecture and Environmental Design from the University of Colorado. Please join me in welcoming Rob McLeod. Thank you, thank you very much. Everybody hear me? Thanks, George. Um, it's a lot to live up to that. <laughs> Obviously, my marketing department wrote that bio for me. Um, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as I was walking over, George and I, um, I, I got to see the campus really for the first time in about 10 years, which has been a magnificent transformation of which, you know, my company worked on a little bit, bits and pieces over the, over the last 20 years, doing renderings and animations for new buildings. And so it's really interesting to see it all now fully built out or, or almost fully built out. So again, thanks for joining uh, today. Thanks for having me in, I appreciate it. So I, I know George gave you kind of the official bio, but, but who the hell am I and why am I qualified to be here talking about design and design thinking? Well, uh, I did study architecture, which means I'm crazy or something like that. Um, and studying architecture was, as it turns out, I didn't become an architect. I, I own a business and I work with architects every day and real estate developers and corporations, but studying architecture and learning how to design 
was critical for me as an entrepreneur in starting a, a company. And so design and design thinking has so many broad implications. And for me personally, I look back to my time at architecture school and it was invaluable in teaching me a couple of things, how to work hard, how to solve problems, and how to iterate. And you know, I heard George li list out kind of the five um, pieces of design thinking, you know, defining, ideation, prototyping, testing. Uh, you know, when you're starting a company and you're an entrepreneur, you're doing that. You're just doing it for your company as an entity, trying to figure out what's going to work for you to grow a company. So, um, design and studying design was very, very helpful for me. So, 21 years ago, me and my two partners started Neoscape, really because we had studied architecture and computer graphics and animation and visualization was a really new thing back in the early 90s. We got into that and really enjoyed it and were better at that than architecture. So we decided to ditch our path to becoming architects and start a company. So um, for me, my role has been particularly client facing. I've always been the sales and marketing person in our company, mostly because the other two guys were way better at producing the stuff, um, which is also an important consideration if you're an entrepreneur or in the design field at all, know what you're good at. Um, and Neoscape, as George said, we're an agency of about 75 people. Most of our work is in real estate and architecture, about 80% of it. The rest is made up of corporate, uh, corporate work. Really important is, is that our company is, is based on being good listeners, truly collaborating with our clients, and matching up with clients who allow us to do what we do best, and that's explore and deliver solutions for them that are far-reaching in terms of their implications. So. Um, the types of things that we do on a daily basis, we started as a 3D visualization company and we've grown. We now do branding and creative and strategy. We do a lot of film work, both you know, practical and uh, computer generated. We do a lot of interactive, including iPad apps and web and AR, virtual reality. Uh, we have a broad base of designers that includes graphic designers, um, UX, UI designers, uh, film people, so we've got a lot of designers, motion graphic artists, uh, and then we all tie it all together with environmental work as well, so making sure that we can deliver a kind of an end-to-end -end solution for our clients. So I uh, thought I'd show you a little bit about how we make stuff at Neoscape. So that shows you a little bit of a glimpse kind of behind the curtain as to how we make things. One of the things that we pride ourselves on as a company is doing everything ourselves. To, you know, to, I, I guess there are a few things we don't do, like fly the helicopters when we shoot heli footage and things like that, but we want to control the whole experience of creating whatever we're creating for our clients. And so uh, because of that, we've grown and added a lot of expertise and gotten wider as a company. And it's interesting because everybody that works for me um, has a broad design background of some kind. It could be filmmaking, it could be architecture, I'd guess of our 75 people, 30 of us went to architecture school. Um, graphic design, um, programming, you name it, 
uh, it, it's a, essentially a loose collection of designers with specialties. And we put teams together specifically for different projects to try to get the best fit for our clients and for the actual uh, project at hand. So um, it's a really interesting place to work from, from that perspective. So often what we're doing for clients is helping them create a story about something. For many of our clients, it's about real estate, about architecture and design, or about something similar to that. So the first thing that we have to do is kind of understand who the audience is, what they're trying to communicate, what the salient points of that story are, and, and how we can distill that down to something that has impact and can be delivered um, to their audiences. So, you know, many times it's kind of all about the visuals for some of our clients. So they kind of want the sex appeal, the sexy image, the sexy animation. And, you know, when I say it's all about the visuals, you know, that can mean a lot of different things. So this first image is a Holocaust memorial competition that we helped a local firm um, compete for. They didn't win, but it was a really interesting process because we were trying, we produced four or five different renderings of this, different seasons to try to really connect emotionally to the, to the people that they were presenting to. And so, Eric's and lighting and a lot of considerations under or in, in help create an, an emotional connection to something. Um, this was inside of it. And so, again, it's a really kind of intimate private space. So this is kind of one, one kind of visual that can help tell a story. And this was, again, part of a bigger story. So these were kind of exhibits, if you will, that were curated within a presentation. Um, they weren't the entire presentation. And that's an important consideration. Everything that we do is part of a bigger story and part of a bigger, bigger picture. So we have to keep that in mind. It's not just about the piece we're doing. Um, markedly different in terms of look and feel. This is a, a, a museum in Guatemala on Mayan culture. Again, a really cool building. We worked, again, on a competition, but it was about you know, telling a different kind of story. It's about, you know, building becoming one with the environment and it's, it's heavy on landscaping and lighting and uh, materiality and so forth. And then you get to something that's a little more in your face, um, like super high-end condominiums. So again, we're trying to create imagery that helps to tell a story. And scale of project is also part of the story. This is a quick rendering of a really big transportation and retail center at Changi Airport in Singapore. And so again, it's, an, it's, a, it's a big scale kind of, um, kind of project. We also do it in motion as well. So one of the important considerations for that project is making sure that the work we're producing tells the right story, fits our client's personality. This client is a little bit more playful, so the work that we did had to kind of reflect their sensibilities and how the world perceives them. Um, I was going to show another film, but I'm going to skip that one. Um, 
because I want to talk for just a minute about relationships. So it's not just about creating stuff, visuals, films, branding. It's about our relationships with our clients, with our clients' clients, to develop a really good and deep understanding of where they come from, from a design perspective, where they're trying to go or take a project, and how we can be part of that. And so you know, something that all of you may experience in your careers is doing your best work for the most exacting and demanding clients. And that is 100% the case with Neoscape. Um, you know, we have a lot of constraints on our work, whether it's schedule, um, budget. There's a lot of them. We have to look at them as opportunities because that's the only way you can break new ground. That's the only way you get more efficient. That's the only way you discover truly what your ceiling is creatively is to be up against the wall in a position where you don't think you can succeed and then figure it out. So that's a really difficult feeling, I think, for a lot of people to reconcile and, and understand. Serial entrepreneurs obviously feed off that. It's like adrenaline to them. Um, but when you're trying to run a profitable business and have employees and make sure that the business stays afloat, you have to take more calculated risks. And those risks are always easier to take with a client that you know really well and who knows, really, who knows you really well. And, and so there's a level of trust. So um, I want to just share a little video that I made of one of my clients. It was when he won um, the AIA, AIA Gold Medal Award um, two years ago, I think 2015. Um, it was really a thank you to him, but, but we've worked with him for 21 years, one of our first clients, and so we have that really deep relationship that allows us to do great work. How can we make it more affordable? How can we make the construction more rational? How can we make it more sustainable? And that means bringing the ground plane into the air. It means manipulating the structure so that it's permeable, that the structure steps like a hillside, in many cases forming roof gardens for everyone a garden. The combination of these elements produces a massing quite different so the views are open in several directions. The objective here is not just to come up with a building that looks different, but that lives different. More privacy, more open space, uh, more individuality. Lots of community open space, both on the ground and at different levels in the air, including the roof. It's a kind of a balance between community and privacy on a whole new level of quality of life. So most of that was filmed during our working sessions on, you know, throughout the course of a project which probably spanned about a year. And hearing directly from Moshe what his design philosophies were, and again, I've been hearing, hearing it for 20 years, so we're really in sync with what he's trying to do. We understand his palette, his design sensibility, and so, you know, we kind of know what to expect. And that allows him, we know what to expect as a baseline, that allows him to push us from a design perspective to do you know, you know, better and better visuals, films, and other storytelling vehicles for him. Um, so ultimately, we're all trying to create impact with the work we do, um, or we're trying to help our clients create impact for the work that they're designing. And so that's a, an interesting takeaway. So I'm not an architect, but I get to work with architects I'm not really an architectural designer, but we get to design a lot of the spaces that we represent because maybe we're re representing them before they're fully designed. But ultimately, we measure our work on does it create the right response with the client base and the audience? Does it get the desired outcome? How do we measure that? It's really hard to measure the importance a rendering or film or campaign has in the lifespan of a project. Um, but we do our best to measure it and, and hopefully repeated successes is what keeps clients coming back to us. So I thought I'd kind of go very quickly through a couple projects and then uh, sit down to, to talk to George. So um, probably about two years ago, a year and a half ago, Rock Rose Development came to us with a project in the DC market. Uh, they had teamed with Elliot Spitzer who owned one property and they bought a property next door. Their goal was to merge those two properties into one property, put a giant atrium in the middle, um, renovate the entire facility, rebrand it, bring it back to market, and lease it up. And this particular developer is probably going to lease it up and hold it because they're a long, more of a long play developer. So um, 
The project became Alexander Court, which we named and kind of did the positioning and strategy for. We also produced a lot of collateral, everything from you know, really beautiful linen-bound uh, books. We did a lot of renderings and other visuals to help tell a story of the transformation of this building. And a lot of it is about making sure we're bringing out the nuances of the design and the details and the materiality. And again, trying to think about each still as, as a narrative. And so there were a lot of components to this building, some of them more troubling in terms of how do they market and position the asset, some of them uh, kind of an easier sell for them, so to speak. Um, a lot of what we're doing for this kind of work is having discussions with our clients about who is their desired tenant, and then we design the interiors to look like that tenant already offices there, and it's a very effective technique. It's not rocket science, but doing it well requires a team that's educated in design and architecture, interiors, possibly fashion, um, graphics, motion, a, lo a lot of things. So again, we understand the, all the storylines of this particular building and then we create visuals to help them tell that story. Shot of the books. We also did virtual reality, it was the first project in the DC market that was using virtual reality to help sell real estate. Um, so we developed it for the Samsung Gear headset. We also did a Google Cardboard version so they could at broker events hand out cardboards and everybody could get a view inside all of those spaces that I showed you as a still rendering. So it's a really effective way to get people to understand design and design intent. One of the best ways we've found for VR on projects like this is when it's under construction and you're doing a hard hat tour with a potential tenant, they can't understand. When it's just concrete and steel and, and raw material, they have no, like they can't, even from a rendering, they have a hard time putting themselves in the space spatially. So VR allows them to stand in what will be the lobby and put a headset on and understand what an 18 story lobby atrium is gonna look and feel like and they can look around uh, we do a lot of VR. We've been doing it almost since we started the company. Just so happens that when we did it 20 years ago, there were no headsets to look at it, so you just looked at it on a computer. But it's the same basic technology that we're using today, so we're really excited about that moving forward. Um, and again, we do a, kind of a whole suite of digital tools, web, iPad, so on and so forth. Uh, here's a shot of the cardboard, pretty straightforward. Uh, we also did a film for this as well. I'm just going to show the first 15, 30 seconds of it. So you start to see that we're, we're going to tell a story about arrival and why this building is, is going to rise above its peers. We use a lot of techniques, a lot of practical photography, a lot of green screening of talent. So if we want to populate the scenes with live actors, actresses, models, we have a green screen facility in our studio. So we can do that on location here in Boston. Uh, we also have a studio in New York where we can do it as well. Um, but again, that process, to make a film like that takes us about 12 weeks. Campaigns with all the renderings and everything else that we're doing take three to six months, typically. And then if we're doing a full-blown campaign with advertising, the lifespan of that may be 18 months to 24 months for them to fully lease up an asset. So we start with a plan and we continually revisit. I like the you know prototype and test. That's what you do when you're doing a campaign. You're out there testing what's getting traction. You know, two years in a real estate market is a long time. So trends change, people's attention span changes, the market overall changes. So we have to have a team that's flexible and adaptable, and we can kind of bring that thinking to bear on our projects for clients very quickly. So I'm going to walk. I want to walk through one more project, and then I have a few takeaways, and then we'll sit down. Um, different kind of project, old Soho building in New York called 462 Broadway. Also, it really has two addresses, 26 Crosby and 462 Broadway. 
our client was um, a, a father and son team, really hands-on. They wanted to be very involved. We came up with a concept to do a brochure that looks like an old you know, album cover. Uh, an album artwork, and so it's a really big piece. It's an expensive piece. They cost about $40 each to produce. Um, but it's really got very kind of high-end techniques, debossing, embossing, foil stamping. It feels really good. It feels like it should cost you $200 a square foot to put your retail operation there. And so that's an important consideration. Every single touch point on all of these projects has to speak to the, the true nature of the project. You can't use super high-end luxury techniques on a project that isn't really that because it's just gonna ring hollow and, and be kind of fake. But this for this project, it worked really, really well. Um, it also had skewed young, so it had a real kind of contemporary vibe to the actual design of the content. And so a lot of bright colors, a lot of bold statements, you know, it felt a little more Soho than if this was Madison Ave or Fifth Avenue retail. Um, classic old building, a lot of square footage. And again, we're just kind of riffing along the way to come up with things that are gonna help our client. Um, renderings are no-brainers. Rendering the space in multiple styles. So again, they said, we're going after Uniqlo, we're going after an Urban Outfitters, we're going after these types of companies. Make sure you're rendering the space to look like those companies. And so that's what we call virtual design build, which is a different kind of design that we love because we do, many of us have an architecture and design background, so we get to you know, design the interiors of some of these spaces, whether it's office or retail or restaurants, and it's, it's a lot of fun um, and takes a lot of research, but uh, it is a great part of what we do. You know, this building has an interesting you know, below grade opportunity, so there's section cuts and other things that are complicated. And again, bringing kind of a full complement of services to our client um, is what we're about. I'm gonna just pop out and go down to some quick takeaways before we start talking. So I know this course is about understanding design and everybody knows that design is everywhere. Even people will say, oh, I don't, I'm not into design. I don't, you make design-based decisions a thousand times a day from the apps you use to the clothes you wear to the shows you, well, everything is design-based. Whether you have a design education or not, you make a lot of your choices based on design, not just aesthetics, not just how something looks, but how it works, how it feels, those details. You know, why do you pick one pair of shoes over another pair of shoes? It's because how they fit and work for you and your body, you know. So those are all design-based considerations and choices. So um, invest in design. What, what do I mean by that? Get an understanding of it. Even if you're an engineer or, or a business student, design is at some point going to be part of your career. So invest in learning about it, invest in understanding it, invest in un understanding how you can leverage design to be better at whatever your specialty is. Design is strategic, that's really important. It's not, you know, certainly people design stuff in a non-strategic way. And those might be the products and services that you don't use or you use it and you're like, this doesn't feel right or there's something wrong, you know. Apple is, is one of the greatest design companies out there most of what they sell, they didn't invent, most of it. They just did it better. You know, iPods, you know, phones, all of it. They didn't invent any of it. They just made a better user experience. They craft the details. They understand the users. They still do a lot of stuff that probably pisses all of us off. But uh, in the end, ultimately, we get a really good end-to-end -end user experience. So they view it as strategic. Every single decision has meaning and weight. Um, also, no matter what you're doing, you know, craft a story and stick to it. The story can evolve and it can change, but start by crafting a story. I don't care what class or what part of life you're, you're trying to tackle. Craft a story, have a clear vision about what you're trying to accomplish, and stick to it. And by sticking to it, you'll probably end up meandering a little bit anyway. I know when I started Neoscape, we had a, we had a vision for the company. It was not very... Um, far-reaching. It was kind of like, hey, I hope we have enough money next month to pay rent. Uh, we didn't have a five-year, we want to do this, we want to grow, we want to become you know, 100 people. There was nothing like that, but over time we started understanding we need to start crafting a story about our company, about our clients and their projects, and then we need to stick to it. 
Um, often just the process of making a business plan or crafting a story about something else. The power of it is almost in crafting it, not that you go back and check the story every day to say, oh, geez, am I on, am I on point? At the end, it's almost better to go back and look at the story and see how close you stuck to it. And I, I would say, for me personally, if you take the time to craft a story and, and set a clear direction, you're going to stick to it just because you went through that process. Um, so I think it's a really important thing to know. Also, no matter what you're doing, make sure you know your audience. And once you kind of know your, your immediate er, or first tier audience, then you can make an attempt to widen it. And I think that's always an, an appropriate way to look at things. Attack the problem at hand first. Understand how design maybe can be leveraged for that. Know the audience. And then once you know it, um, widen it. And also, again, this is not something I invented, but design an experience. Don't just design a thing. You know, and again, I'll use Apple as an example. Unpackaging one of their devices is an experience that they labor over. And, they th and every other company out there is trying to copy that attention to detail. Or somebody like Uber. That's a great user experience. You don't have to pull money out. You don't have to tip. It's so easy that everybody out there is trying to be the Uber of something, which usually doesn't even make sense for whatever their business is. They're just trying to glom onto that as, as a way to show you that they're the best of the best. Um, and one way to create an experience is to, is to create a story about whatever it is you're trying to communicate. So keep those things in mind. And I think um, understanding design will be a lifelong pursuit. So. That's it for the formal part of the presentation. Thank you. That's great. Um, you know, it seems like every time we have a guest, I think, oh my gosh, that's the, this is the most appropriate guest we could possibly have for this course. So I can't say that again because I've already said it like nine times <laughs> this semester. Um, but I, I really appreciated the, the wrapping up that you did because it really, uh, first of all, it's a great presentation technique that I like to use too, which is to not just end, but in fact, at the end of this course, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation about what we're trying to get out of it, because it, it, it does help people to go away with something other than, wow, that's over. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Put an exclamation point or right. a period on the end. Right, yeah. right. Well, um, you know, let's just start with the importance of the story. I'm, I'm teaching a, a, an urban design studio right now for the first time in many, many years, and I find myself insisting that each student even though they have a very different project, ha be able to articulate in no more than three sentences what this is about. Because if you're not sure what it's about, it's pretty unlikely it's going to be excellent. <laughs> or that it's <laughs> right. going to solve a problem. Right. It would just be dumb luck. Yep, um, absolutely. So I, I just, I think that's really, um, you know, when I met you, you were, you were I, I think, most obsessed about how you were going to fit all of these when I met Rob, he had, his office was filled with little servers, racks of servers, because you had the biggest issue, it seemed to me, I, I wasn't part of the company, but I, in chatting with you, was, oh my gosh, how are we ever going to render this thing that we're right. trying to render? And that's still a problem. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing that it's, it's still e a It's easier to, to tackle now, but technology yeah. is still a... Some people think we're a technology company, and we are absolutely 100% not. We are a, we're a people and artists company but we use technology and so that server issue you know compute power has gotten infinitely better since 1995 so your phone in your pocket is probably no joke 10 times more powerful than our first server and so that's pretty cool yeah. you know to have that in your pocket but now we're also rendering all the films that we do in 4k or at the very least full HD right. and so you know, when computers get faster, you just put more stuff into the scenes to make it take longer again. Sure, so sure. we have hundreds of render nodes that are basically cranking 24 hours a day. So we invest heavily in two things. Yeah. Technology, just so that it makes the lives of the artists better and easier. So we invest in people, and that's our, that's like 70% of a company's expenditure, right. basically, is the talent. Uh, and the, the technology just enables them to do their job better. So I'm really curious um, because it's clear that you have used sort of design thinking techniques. We well, use them all the time, but I'm particularly interested in how you imagined the growth of Neoscape because 
um, again, I mean, I saw it when it was like three, four people, um, you know, just darkened room, <laughs> yeah. screens all the time. But so you, how much of the evolution of the company into one that is much more about communication, storytelling, narrative, um, how much of that evolution was your own self-conscious like pivoting and how much of it was um, the environment changing so rapidly that you've kind of had to, you and your partners had to say, okay, what problems are we going to be solving here? Because the landscape of problems seems to be changing dramatically. Yeah, one, one of the things that happened early on is we, because we went to architecture school, my two partners are also trained in architecture, we thought most of our clients would be architects. Mm -hmm. And it took us probably a year or two to realize that that they probably weren't going to be the bulk of our clients. And right now, about 70% of our clients are developers, right, right. and 30% are architects or designers of some kind. Um, and so that was our first kind of pivot. And once we did that, we had kind of different challenges. We still get to help our clients work with their architects, and mm -hmm. so it's architect and developer, typically. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we did, which helped guide the evolution, is we we were told we had we had some advisors at the beginning, um, namely one of my partners is my brother, so our father was one of our advisors, right. and my other partner's father was an advisor, right. and it was you know just real simple stuff like always hire people who are better than you, right, right. always from day one. So our first employee has been with us for 20 years, still with us. And he was so good, he was such a good artist that we didn't, there's no way we can get this guy, he's too good, you know, we, when we hired him, he was making, you know, probably 10 grand more than us, <laughs> which is which is hard, you know, as a, as a small company. But what he brought was a different way to think and help us advance, and so we hired well, mm -hmm. whether it was because we were good at it naturally or we just had dumb luck or the pool of people interested in what we were doing was so small that only, super passionate, dedicated people were interested in it because right, it was kind of right. new back then. Right. So we hired good people and th it was those people and trusting those employees to open our eyes to better, bigger ways of doing work. So things like when we started, you know, the films that I showed today, those would have been virtual tours. Those would have been very literal walks through buildings, like literally from the parking lot into the front door, down the hallway, up the stairs, into the elevator. And that's what our clients wanted, because that was new. We want to we want to see every single bit of this thing. And but I had good good employees who were into filmmaking and into storytelling with other mediums. And they're like, why, why do we need to be so literal? So right, we right, right. one of the things we did early on was kind of reinvent the virtual tour in the early 2000s to be more cinematic. Mm -hmm. It's about music and mood and talent and. You don't have to be so literal, and so we did some kind of groundbreaking work back in the early 2000s, which changed people's perception of what a virtual tour was. Sure. So, you know, hiring well right. helped us. We didn't consciously say, "Oh, well, now we need to do this." Now we need to. We, we would hire good people, and they would just start doing stuff, yeah, 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 yeah. or or bring ideas to us and present it. We also, a couple years in, you know, we we wrote a business plan uh, before we started the company. We should have just burned it on day one because it was so off base. But a couple of years in, we took stock of where we were and we were probably you know, five employees and right. we wrote another business plan. And it, it became a historical document as opposed to a daily guide. We'd write down, okay, where do we think we wanna be? Where do we think the work's gonna be? Right. And, and then we would go back and look at it a year later. How'd we do right. against the plan? And again, we weren't checking every day, but just writing it down and formulating it is almost enough. Right, right, right. No, I, 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 my experience is exactly the same, that even when you are forced to do certain kinds of evaluative work, self-evaluative work, whether it's applying for a loan or in, in the School of Architecture, getting accredited and re-accredited, you dreaded these things. But they required you to put in the front of your mind like a, a, as accurate an assessment of where you are and where it appears you intend to go. <laughs> and, uh, right. and then you can kind of look at that and say, does that make any sense? Um, and I think it's good at expose, you know, being self-critical is important to expose weaknesses right. uh, and then make corrections. Right. And, and so there's a lot of that that goes on, I would say almost on a daily basis at Netscape. You know, the business about hiring people who are smarter than you are, first of all, perhaps in our cases, that's fairly easy to do. Yep. But, <laughs> 100%. <laughs> but, but uh, it is not, the default condition of almost any human 
I mean, it's amazing. If you ever think about, I don't know if you guys have had to hire anybody yet, probably not, but if you have, um, you know, there's a kind of default, uh, my own theory is anyway, everyone is deeply insecure. And therefore, if you hire somebody who's not as smart as you are, then perhaps you will get some um, emotional benefit from that. But it's not going to, you do that a few times and you end up with a group that's not really the sharpest knife in the drawer. Whereas right. if you do the opposite, you end up looking great in reflection. <laughs> right. And, and learning to trust them quickly yes. and empower them with responsibility. There, I mean, there are a lot of people out there who are the kind of people that want responsibility yeah. and they're just going to, they're just going to kind of take it and move the ball forward. They're going to take it or leave. Right. If you don't or they're going to leave. Yeah. So um, trying to find those people, also identifying people who are, you know, a lot of our people are artists and they're really talented artists. It doesn't mean they can or want to manage people right. or clients or projects. And so there's kind of a, a balance there of making sure we have great artists, great technicians for some of the more technical work that we do, and then really good managers and leaders. And they don't necessarily, it took us a long time to hire people who weren't producing work. Mm -hmm. So getting somebody who's just a pure manager or, or somebody who's got great leadership abilities is super important, but we had a hard time, oh man, they're not quote unquote billable. So how do we deal with somebody who's not making right. films and renderings? Right, right, right. So, but those are all things that, you know, we tackled and got past and. You know, I want to, I want to ask you uh, just a little bit more about the, um, going from the kind of virtual tour, which is solving the problem of how would one walk through this building and nothing more. Right. To addressing the latent demand of what I really want it, it, as a lifestyle choice if I'm going to live in Chelsea in New York. Why, why do I want to do that? And, and, the, and you, you, when you make a film as opposed to a virtual tour, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you are answering that question for me. Like, what would it be like? What would it yeah, feel? What would it feel like? It's, a, it's an emotional. We want to develop. We want our clients to get an emotional attachment. Or, you know, if you're looking for a super high-end condominium, you're looking at ten different projects, maybe. Right, 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 How right, do you right. differentiate? How do you make sure you capture what that's like? How do you capture it? when you have no idea what it's like to live in a $50 million right. penthouse. Right, right. That's also a challenge. Right, right. Um, it takes a lot of research and a lot of kind of getting yourself deeply involved in that. But um, yeah, having that emotional response, you know, music, right, right. cinematography, thinking about it like cinematography, not right. just moving around a, right, right, a right, computer right. camera, right. you know, changes your way of thinking about it. And studying, you know, film, has been around for well over 100 years, mm -hmm. and good filmmaking has been around for a long, long time. Right. So we went back to basics. You know, why are we doing things? Just because we can do it on a computer doesn't mean you so, should. So true, so true. And so you see that in architecture. You see that in a lot of, right. lot of design um, things, but it's going back to basics is one of the things we say all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, our, our, the book we're, we've been using, Change by Design, CEO of IDL mm -hmm. is all about identify, or it's all about it, several things, but one of them is identify, understanding latent demand and also the power of emotion when it comes to actually dis making decisions. So it's not just that this is, it, it's not just that it's more interesting to make films than it is to make walkthroughs. I'm sure, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure, maybe I should ask, are you able to demonstrate to clients how much more effective that sort of thing is. In other words, can you, you demonstrate, I guess, in sales or in, in speed of sellout? Or, I mean, how do you do that? Yeah, that's what, so the return on investment, I touched on it earlier, it's really hard for us to capture it and present it authoritatively. Like what would it have been like if we hadn't hired Neoscape? And right. Then, what, uh, then what's the margin? Because they might have had, you know, and, the, and sometimes we have clients who, to them, a rendering is a rendering. Right. There's right. no, you know, some people, a car is a car, and if it gets you from point A to point right. B, it's doing what they want it to do. Right. Other people need, you know, something more than that, very right. something very specific. You know, I, I tell people, you know, what happens if you're watching your favorite film and you turn the audio off? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You lose about 75% of your connection to that film if there's no audio. So we use techniques like that when clients are like, oh, we don't want to pay for a custom score, or we don't want people in it, or we don't want, can't you just, mm -hmm do a virtual tour right, and right. you know for most of them we'll just say no it's not what we do we do it differently here are the reasons why we think you should go this route 
And here are the other successful high-end projects, by the way, that have used our services, in yeah. case you're wondering. Right, and so we, we do a lot, and a lot of them know, which is why they come to us, because we don't, we don't advertise, it's all word of mouth. But still, you get people who are resistant to doing sure. certain things, and so you know, there are definitely techniques we can use to get them to see, you know, sometimes it's hiring better talent, or, <laughs> or renting a bigger stage, or doing things that they, they might not understand why it's gonna pay off, but um, we're pretty good at helping convince them. Yeah. Um, Okay, let me just, uh, so you answered this business about, I was curious if the majority of your customers were real estate developers, and the answer is clearly yes. Yep. And then, but when you are working with architects, um, is it a little bit, uh, is the dynamic different where you're sort of designing for designers who then have their own clients? In other words, it seems to me, uh, I'll put it this way, in my limited experience in this world, as you know, in our AR company, mm -hmm. it's, it's very limited, but it is a little uh, weird. It's much more straightforward dealing with uh, real estate people because yep. they know what they don't know, and that's why they hired you. And I'm just curious, how does it, what's the dynamic like as you work for people where you're trying to help them deal with their clients? It's, uh, you know, architects, I think, are um, their own breed, kind mm -hmm. of. And so working with architects takes a different mentality for us as a company, and even within the realm of working for architects, different kinds of work carry different constraints or parameters or challenges or opportunities. So if you're doing competition work, which is how we started our career with Moshe Safdi, uh -huh. doing three or four competitions a year, that is some of the most grueling work our studio does. Mm -hmm. You know, you they have six weeks to design something, mm -hmm. So they want to use all six weeks to design that thing and make it as good as possible. We need to fit ourselves into their process because our stuff's also due in six weeks. Mm -hmm. And that might be 20 renderings and a film about their project, which they're going to design up until mm -hmm. the fifth yeah. week, yeah. sixth day, basically. Right, 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 right. And so they're, they're super intense. They're very grueling. They often include multiple all-nighters. You know, back when our studio was small, it could be 15 of us pulling an all-nighter or three or four all-nighters in a week to get the job done. And so it's really tough, but that's how architects often work. And, right. and Moshe Softy's office is, is very much a, you know, I got a call probably three or four years ago from one of the principals there, and he was mad at me. The call was at about 1.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. He leaves me a voicemail. Why the F aren't you here? Right, at right. the office. <laughs> you know, we're all working all night. Right. We expect you to be working all right, night. Right. Now, of course, we do and have worked all night for them, still continue to do it, but this particular night, the computers were doing the work that night. Right, right, and right. so we get to a certain point where we need to just let it put pencils down and be hands off. So architects are, you know, can be challenging in that regard. Right. But we also have enough of us trained in architecture that we kind of know we can also build a team and a pipeline. You know, now we know at least to ask the questions, how bad is this going to be for right. us, George, right. When, right. when we do this competition right. together? And we, it's an honest question. Right. Like, right. are you going to put us through the ringer on this? That's a fair question to ask because I'm going to ask my employees to do something that goes way above and beyond, and I need to know it's worth it mm -hmm. for them to, to make that investment. And there are plenty of times when we say, you know what? We can't do it. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do it. We just came off of another competition. We're not doing another one. Mm -hmm. We need a break. Mm -hmm. uh, and developers are definitely different. They're demanding. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're petulant. Mm -hmm. and, and their demands have more to do with them making money right. and less about making sure the design's right. Mm -hmm. And so, but they make decisions a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Their threshold for pain when it comes to budgets is a lot higher. Mm -hmm. um, but they're equally as demanding in terms of expectations, customer service, things like that. You know, we're a creative agency, but we're really a customer service service mm -hmm. provider. And right. so that's a really interesting dynamic when we're trying to provide the best experience for our clients. And, that, and sometimes our employees think that that means we just say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we say yes if mm -hmm. every time. Yes, we can do those 10 extra renderings on the same schedule if we you know, get more budget to hire more people. Right, 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 right. Or yes, we can do it if we get more time. Mm -hmm. And so there's very thoughtful conversations that go into dealing with, you know, again, those are our two largest groups of clients, right. and then I would say corporate clients are third, and that's a whole other uh, dynamic, which is equally as challenging and rewarding, but um, 
yeah, it's we've got a, a good good mix of clients that makes it interesting. Yeah. So, um, part of the reason that we've rekindled our, our friendship is because um, of the company that I'm now involved with, and, and you, you, Terrence was a guest earlier in the course. Oh, cool. So they've already they already know of, about building conversation. But um, you know, one of the things when I zoom out and think about things like these large design issues, a apart from my own uh, interest in a very small enterprise, is with the rise of um, virtual reality and augmented reality, um, do, you th do you imagine your, this having a, an ever larger impact on your world? Because it seems to me that, that as soon as tools for graphic design became universally acceptable, uh, accessible in the digital realm, suddenly everybody's a graphic designer. <laughs> as soon yes. as, yeah. right? In other words, as these devices spread tools that empower the average person to enter the realm of the expert, um, you know, like uh, the average YouTube video is not necessarily at the same quality as the average, you know, feature film uh, circa 1965. Uh, uh, you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. If I can make a digital model in SketchUp on my phone, and I can make a, you know, you know it, 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 what do you think is going to happen as this becomes ever more ubiquitous? Uh, well, you know, this is not new. You know, VR, AR, some of the new technology is just the latest of something that's know, been around kind of democratizing while. design, which doesn't mean it's good just because you have InDesign or Photoshop doesn't mean you're any good at it or that your ideas are good, which is which is always sobering for people who have told me, oh, you do 3D rendering? Yeah, I'm going to learn that some yeah. weekend and then I'm going to do, <laughs> and, you know, it's great. If they can, more power to them. I love the dynamic and the disruption that virtual reality and AR is providing us because A, people are paying attention mm -hmm. and wanting to do things differently. Again, I love that our architects use it in-house. I love that they use it to make sure their designs don't suck. Right, right, right. Because right. that's a really important <laughs> use of a lot of this digital and virtual technology is get in there and prototype. Right. That's the prototype. It's right. a digital prototype. Right. It's fully functional. It's immersive. Right. You can do anything you want in it, right. but make sure it's right. Right, right. And right. test it and then revise it. And so it's a really powerful tool even before the stuff makes it to us. Right. And that's then a good it point. becomes even more powerful because everybody in the developer world and the architecture world knows about it and they're scrambling to find a way to apply it. Mm -hmm. But in some ways, you know, it started out as a solution in search of a need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now there are many, 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 many applications that are appropriate. Doesn't mean all of them are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm excited that it's kind of come back because we were into it 20 years ago right. and then the technology wasn't there to support it. So now right. the technology's there. I heard a stat the other day that said that augmented reality by 2020 will be an $80 billion industry. That's just, I, we virtual, hear things. virtual reality will be $20 billion right. or something like that. So people are betting longer on augmented or mixed reality than they are on just pure virtual reality. And I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, virtual reality is super labor intensive mm -hmm. and very costly and time consuming. Right. And if you're augmenting reality, 90% of, of what you're experiencing, or maybe more, exists. Is and it, you're just it, augmenting that it. That free reality that the, we inhabit. Yeah, yes. Right. <laughs> and so that's important. And I think it has a lot more uh, far-reaching uses right. when you take that approach. So I was, interestingly enough, last week I was in Philadelphia talking to a corporation called St. Gobain, which is, they make building products. Mm -hmm. I thought my company was doing pretty good at 21 years old. Their, their company is 350 years old. It's based out of France. And we were in their US headquarters in Philly. And I, they are so engaged on this technology stuff. Uh, and I was talking about AR and VR. And many people in the audience probably knew more than I did. Mm -hmm. you know, And that was really cool. Right. Because right. You know, they've got whole departments now exploring how it's going to change the building products industry that they've been a leader in for 350 years. So. You know, uh, I, I, I was just uh, at the ABX conference, yep. um, and there was awful, we were part of a group showing AR and VR solutions, and, you know, it's certainly not getting less popular. No. <laughs> um, but, it, it, you know, one of the other things, one of the other sort of larger truths that we've been uncovering in this course 
is how significant the so-called sharing economy is to transforming our regular lives. We, I told you we had Robin Chase in here, the mm -hmm. founder of Zipcar, but what she really was talking about wasn't Zipcar, but was the coming revolution of autonomous vehicles. And it's really, when you, when you just think about the consequences for a second, it's, it's huge. And I've immediately, I've been recalibrating what I, what I'm, how I'm gonna spend the design, my design energies for the next five years around this issue. But I'm wondering if, and maybe in, a, in, a, in your business, it, it really, it, that's not really an issue, but you know, whether it's Airbnb, all these things that are just changing how people are going to buy capital goods they're not going to buy them, they're just going to use them. Yep. And I'm wondering, I, I, I don't imagine it's going to affect the beautiful cinematic manufacturing of your videos, but in fact, maybe it'll be a boon because there'll be a whole new layer of marketing associated with real estate that's more on demand. I'm just, I, 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 is this something you guys have thought about at all? Yeah, we, we have thought about it a little bit. And it's as opposed to 30 year leases or 15 year leases, yeah. it's just as, I, as needed. Right shrinks and grows, yeah. scalable. It's really, it's very interesting. The WeWorks of the world yeah. have disrupted real estate quite well. Uh, and we see it having, you know, now when your biggest, when your ideal client is WeWork, mm -hmm. because they're gonna take a big block of space to allow right. people to use that new system of officing. Right. It's a really interesting and dynamic um, thing that's happening in the market. We've always been dealing with kind of more and more people getting into what we do. Um, you know, when we started, there were only a handful of companies doing it. Mm -hmm. And now every single architecture firm has a pretty robust and very talented group of people doing what we do. And so ultimately for us, I think some of our cachet will be the ideas, you know, the right. kind of, the story. Right, right, right. You right. know, so filmmakers are not gonna go away. They may be delivering films totally differently. Right. And now you hear people getting into multi-screen experiences, so you're interacting with the content in many more ways than just sitting there watching your TV or, or a movie. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really excited about that, and I'm sure that Netflix or Amazon or Google, somebody like that is gonna provide the game-changing moment yeah. for consuming the kind of content that we create. I mean, I, I wish we could, but I think that the reality is the Netflix, the Apples, the Googles, poised to do yeah, that yeah, pretty yeah. well. And have the have robust infrastructure yes. already in place. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, just one thing, and I'm, this is kind of brainstorming on the stage, which is not what we usually do in here, um, but it does seem to me that the idea of um, very specific, let's, if we just talk about office space, very specific types of office space, which is a, pretty much of a commodity. It, it, it exists at different levels. There's, I don't know how many of you know about commercial real estate, but there's sort of Class A office space, which is, has a certain level of amenities, and then Class B, which is not as nice but costs less, and Class C, sort of back of house um, space. But you can imagine um, a series of components, really, um, along the lines of, if you go to a WeWork or you go to one of these places with shared office, they'll have a set of conference rooms of a certain kind, or you go to the Mass Challenge space, or, yeah. or you go to the, you know, um, th there's only a few components, really, um, meeting space, collaborative workspace, private workspace, bathrooms, uh, maybe a kitchen. Um, so the idea that one could, um, in a way, market all of that stuff via emotion-filled uh, marketing materials, yeah. and then build it or even reconstitute a flexible system to suit the market. I'm just trying to... If, if what these disruptive companies do is they find a, a, a smoother way to satisfy market need, which is what they do, right? They yeah. like you press one button and, and your car comes and pays and tips and everything, that's a better experience. Right. The idea that you guys could be involved in the creation of a, a kind of catalog of office space that could, could suit almost any need, that could be you know, what gets shared with the developer, here's what you should build. I mean, do you work that way at all now? A little bit. I think one of the interesting things about all the companies that you're talking about, so it's WeWork, it's you know, Liquid Space, or yep. you know, any of these, Shared or Uber or Zipcar, they all really appreciate design, and they're all really exceptionally designed experiences. Yes. So when you 
you know, Airbnb is not a totally new concept. Uber is not a new concept. There was a company called Magic Cab, which couldn't execute. So, you know, I don't know if anybody here um, follows Gary Vaynerchuk. Anybody know who he is? Serial entrepreneur. He is a very coveted speaker at colleges and other events. You should check out his, his blog. Vaynerchuk Media is his company. And I watch him a lot because mm -hmm. he, he's like, ideas are not the currency mm -hmm. right now. It's execution. Mm -hmm. And so you execute things better than the competitor by having a better designed experience. Mm -hmm. So you could both, you know, everybody in here can start with the same idea. And that doesn't mean that everybody's going to execute it the same way. So true. And so he focuses on execution and design is a big part of that execution. So all these disruptive things are game changers, but the ones that are floating to the top have better design, have a better designed experience right, for, right, the end, right, right. for the end user. So um, it's really interesting. You know, the building that we're in now is the innovation and design building, which when we moved there four years ago, it was just really cheap industrial uh, real estate on the waterfront in South Boston. And our landlord came in and had an idea to make it kind of hip and cool, like Chelsea Market and some other. Same landlord as Chelsea. Same landlord. And they kind of have a formula. We know how to do it. Right. And they apply deep design thinking to every experience, every amenity, every perception. So they take you know these tired old pre-war assets, which are actually the kinds of, of buildings that super innovative companies want to be in. For Absolutely. some reason, innovation likes these really, you know, brick it, shithouse type buildings that, that are, are just built for, you know, to be around for hundreds right. of years. And with big floor plates. With That's big what floor they really plates, like. yes. That's what they really like. Um, that provide a lot, of, a lot of the flexibility and expansion and scalability that right. most right. of these companies covet. And, and so, but they had a clear vision and they applied thorough and consistent design thinking throughout the asset. And now, three years later, it's, it's the hottest. transformed. It's one of the hottest pieces of real estate in, in Boston. I mean, we're both there. I mean, I mean you know, yeah. you know, if that's not evidence, I don't know what is. Yeah. I, I want to ask you one more question, then I want to open it up and see if uh, our, the students have any questions. Um, what's the worst idea that you ever had? Uh, people, sometimes if we, if we, when we interview people for this course, it seems like, God, they're nothing but geniuses. They only have outstanding ideas every day. They just wake up and it's just, which outstanding am idea am I going to execute on today? If you don't mind, mm -hmm. surely, if you're anything like me, you've had, you have a wide list to choose from. But <laughs> what's the word, as, as Neoscape was developing, did, was there a time when you, like, you guys totally misread what was going on or you thought you should get into a part of the business that proved to be a terrible idea? Yeah. Yeah, th there... The list of mistakes and failures <laughs> is epically long. Uh, one of them that, um, there are a couple that I'll focus okay. on. One was more, you know, based on the people we were hiring, and this was back in the late 90s during the, the internet bubble. We made, we're like, everybody's telling us, you guys have to capitalize on, you know, become an internet company. Right, right. And we didn't know what that meant exactly, but we tried to kind of pivot and become an internet company and we came about this close to bankrupting and going out of the business, wow. going out of wow. business. Because we didn't even know what it meant, but right. we were, you know, there was such a... No, I remember. Y you know, um, so that was one of the first bad mistakes that we made. Another one was going after work in the gaming industry. Mm. Because a lot of our employees Employees who come out with 3D modeling and rendering and animation skills, they've got kind of a couple markets available to them, or they had, they had fewer back then. It was, you went and worked in Hollywood on movies, mm -hmm. you worked for gaming companies, mm -hmm. or if those two failed, which is typically how it worked, then you would come work for a boring company like Neoscape that only did 3D around real estate and things like that. And so um, a lot of our employees were gamers or came from game companies, and they're like, oh man, wouldn't it be so cool if we could do this? And so. We tried to do it, and we did work on a couple of games, right. and it was a beyond a bad experience in terms of you know, kind of what it forced us to do and, and how we had to kind of retool our operation to and talk about, you know, th their whole motif is they'll work hard on a game for two years, and by hard I mean 80 to 100 hours a week. Mm. 
for two years, and then they hope to sell 20 million copies of whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And we were just a little piece of that. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the expectations about you know trying to get us to sign agreements saying that every one of our employees was going to work a minimum of 80 hours a week, <laughs> you know, just things that are that are crazy. Right, right. Um, but it works in film because people still, if you're going to go make Lord of the Rings, you'll right. sign one of those contracts and you right. go to New Zealand and right. you work for 80 hours a week. Right for a year, right. and then you take a year off because right. you've made so much money right. and right. you haven't been able to spend it because you're just working. Right. Right. And so it works for a certain mentality, but not to build a company on. Right. Right. So these game companies also you know, develop a title, and then they'll often, and same with visual effects studios, and then they'll lay everybody off. Mm. Uh, if the game does great, they may not need to, but there's often a, a lull or a mm. break between titles. Right. And so we went hard after that yeah, market, yeah. and again, almost bankrupted us. Um, the last failure, and I know you only asked for one, but there's just too many. So in 2008, um, again, most of our work is in real estate. Everybody knows or should remember what happened in 2008 with the economy collapsing. Real estate was one of the hardest hit industries out there. So all the kind of big players had enough capital, they could kind of just duck and cover, hang onto their assets, and they'd pop their head back up when the economy started to improve. So we had about 65 employees at the time. Um, we had one client who provided about 50% of our revenue. Yeah. Unbeknownst to us, between Christmas and New Year's 2008 to the beginning of 2009, he got fired. And we had 17 people working on just his account. Wow. And that, he didn't resurface in any way, shape, or form for about a month. So it took us a month to find out he had been fired five weeks earlier. Right, right. We had 17 people who were chugging sold. away oh my goodness. <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work that we ended up not being able to bill for because mm -hmm. the guy who was going to sign the check and approve the expenditure got fired. Mm -hmm. So quickly but not quickly enough, I had to lay that team off. 17 people mm -hmm. in the blink of an eye got good, great people. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then it got worse after mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. the entire market, we were, in a sense, we knew there were bad things happening in the market we had some good clients and they weren't, they were affected a lot later. So we ended up doing two rounds of layoffs, laid off 30 people out of 65. Mm. And then basically we just used all the funds the company had saved to pay the people we wanted to keep. People that we knew could stick with it, could help us become a new, different, better company. Um, so we, it's not that we had no work, but our work probably got cut, our staff got cut in half and our work got cut down to about a third. Yeah. So revenue went from, I'll just use round numbers, 10 million to 3 million. Wow. And so, you know, we basically self-financed to get the company going. So the lesson we learned was, if you're faced with that kind of adverse, be more decisive. Right, right, Make right. the hard decisions just do early, it. just yeah. do it. Right, right. Uh, it's not ever gonna feel good. Mm -hmm. to, you know, in that case, it's not gonna feel good, but there are a lot of decisions. I'd rather have somebody make the wrong decision than no decision at all. I say that to all my employees, and they could be 18 years old, mm -hmm. or they could be a seasoned veteran. Mm -hmm. Make a decision. Mm -hmm. Just pick. Just mm -hmm. do something. Don't mm -hmm. do nothing. Right. Um, and so, we should have done something a lot sooner right. in that case. Those are great. So. Those are great examples. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, most of the software that we use is, uh, we do all our rendering in 3D Studio Max. The render engine that we use is called V-Ray. So there's lots of kind of specialty engines out there that have um, different benefits depending on what kind of work you're doing. That one works the best for us. Produces really good, predictable results quickly. Um, we use the Adobe Creative Suite. You know, so we have all 5,000 programs they make now <laughs> um, available to all of us. Um, there's a lot of specialty software like Nuke for compositing, After Effects, um, a lot of other modeling tools that are specialized like Rhino and Revit, um, things that maybe allow you to do one thing really well. Um, we've seen a lot of changes in how our clients work. Mm -hmm. So the design community has gone from kind of a dumb way of building things in 3D and designing things like AutoCAD. Mm -hmm. It's kind of dumb, doesn't have a lot of intelligence built into it. Um, so everybody uses this building information modeling system now called BIM, so they use Revit. And it has deep information in it. 
which is great for the designers, not great for us, because we get models that are huge, are huge, have you know everything you see inside the walls, and so for us, we just strip all that stuff out and we make something that's appropriate for visualization. But um, it has created an interesting dynamic where clients are like, well, we gave you a model, shouldn't it be a lot cheaper now? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is, um, but sometimes it's a lot of work to. We, we have to, as you can imagine better than I, because you know more about this, we have to do all this optimization. A lot of optimization yes. as well. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's sim simple, like turning off layers. Other times it's more complicated. I'm yep. told people who yeah. are doing it are telling me. <laughs> yes. You. But th that's that's kind of the basic packet. Photoshop is kind of one of our um, go to. So the work that you saw today, our goal is to have everything when we render it come out in a hundred percent usable fashion. But the, the reality is, we do about ten percent of the work is done in post. So color correction, color grading, you know, we might have something in our minds about how this film should look in terms of its color palette overall. And we're combining things that we filmed with things that we're creating in CG. So at the end, we have to go through and grade everything so it looks like it was all produced together. So color grading software, editing software, we use a combination of Final Cut and Premiere. So there's a lot, there's a lot of software out there. Um, and if anybody's interested in that kind of stuff, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk or, or connect you with a more technical um, resource. Um, it's interesting, we don't hire people who are good at that software necessarily. You know, we hire somebody who's good at art, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even if they're a hand artist. We can take a hand artist and make them a great production artist for us mm -hmm. by teaching them those tools. And the good thing is they've got 30 or 40 people at the company that can teach them. So. Other questions? Okay. Well, Rob, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody.